In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last Thursday, <clears throat> I had a picnic lunch with a friend before going brambling down a little country path somewhere in the deepest, darkest Hertfordshire. As we went along, I was aware that I had to prepare this sermon, so I kept thinking about how we ought to be thankful for all God's gifts and remembering the folk superstition about how the devil puts a blight on the brambles on Michaelmas Day. So in addition to the thankfulness I felt for the fruits of the earth, I was also thanking God for the bright sunshine, the warm temperature, and anticipating being thankful all over again when the time came to have the blackberry and apple crumbles in the dark, cold days of winter. I was marvelling at the wildlife, the spider's webs, the butterflies, the red kites, and as I was typing these notes I could hear a pair of blue tits on the willow tree just outside my window, doing exactly what I'd been doing on Thursday. Well, not exactly. They were picking greenfly and other little beasties off the leaves. The difference between me and the blue tits, apart from the obvious ones, was that I was doing my brambling for future enjoyment, and the blue tits were scavenging for whatever they could find, because if they don't eat whatever they can, whenever they find it, they will die. We can see in these two very simple examples an illustration of contrasting ways to organise society. On the one hand, we have people able to put away stuff to protect them if hard times come. People like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg. People who are so rich that they needn't make another penny for the rest of their lives, and they'd still be able to live in luxury for the rest of their lives, them and their descendants, even unto the third and fourth generations. One person in the Old Testament who was pretty well off was King David. He'd had a pretty eventful life with battles, murders, love affairs. And when he thought his life was all sorted, he started to wonder about what he could do to thank God for all the blessings he'd received during his career. It occurred to him that God didn't really have a place for his residence other than the vintage tabernacle that had been dragged through rivers and deserts. David decided that God should be housed in a building worthy of his majesty. So he took soundings and word came back through the prophet Nathan that God didn't want a temple to be built except by a man of peace. And Solomon, whose very name means peace, was the right man to build it. But David set aside all manner of metals, stones and wood, gold and silver, in readiness for the time when he had died and Solomon had succeeded to the throne. And what David had stored up, a bit like a farmer keeping some seed to sow for the next spring, Solomon sowed. Paul referred to this sort of process when he said that he, Paul, planted the gospel, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that's one aspect of the way in which the world works. People who can live comfortably, who have enough to be comfortable, like me going out brambling. And there are the overwhelming majority of the people of this earth who are like the blue tits, eating whatever they can find in the knowledge that if they don't find enough to keep body and soul together, body and soul will separate, they will die. The fact that this state of affairs exists at all would seem to run counter to the thought in the poem No man is an island unto himself, Humanity is a single organism. We're all related to each other. And what Paul says about the human body is true. If one part suffers, the whole body suffers. If this gross disparity of wealth has a spotlight shone onto it when we read what the beloved disciple wrote, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? John is here saying that a society that can countenance this gross inequality of wealth is one the love of God is not present in. But when we think about sharing the good things of the world to enable God's love to dwell in us, it's not only about sharing material goods. 
Yes, we must care for refugees. We must put what we can afford into the food bank boxes in the supermarkets. We must do what Jesus tells us in Matthew's Gospel. Clothe the naked, feed the starving, visit the sick and those in prison, welcome the stranger. But we mustn't get all pedantic about it. It's perhaps a temptation to think, well, my neighbours all have clothes, I know all of them. None look hungry and, if anything, Mrs. Bloggs might benefit from a little less to drink and none of the neighbours is in prison. So there aren't any acts of charity for me to perform to keep in Jesus' good books. Something happened the other day just after our picnic. Is that a large poodle came bounding over towards us, looking for any bits of food we might have dropped. Its owner came not far behind, and my friend and the dog's owner started chatting. I was initially reluctant, reluctant um, to join in because I felt it was an intrusion. But my friend's always happy to talk, and eventually I felt drawn into the conversation. We went on chatting for about 45 minutes and discovered that the dog's owner's children had been in the same class at primary school with my friend's daughters about 50 years ago. It was only later, as Jean and I were picking our blackberries, that it occurred to me that the conversation that I did initially felt was holding us up had actually been a sort of thanksgiving. That conversation had been a gift, a gift which enabled human contact to, to flourish, a conversation that made a difference to all three of us. And I suspect that the dog was also affected as it looked distinctly bored by the time we'd finished. If we're going to follow the instructions of Jesus, there are going to have to be times when we think outside the box, when we interpret what he said in ways which are guided by the spirit of what he said, rather than doing what the Pharisees might have done, to quibble and nitpick about who my neighbour is and who I should give the time of day to. Initially, I had not been able to see that what that conversation was really all about. It wasn't about schools and the people who'd lived in various houses we were going to pass on our walk. The conversation was about deepening human relationships, discovering connections, sharing insights, remembering our shared past. And if that isn't a neat summary of our relationship with God, I don't know what is. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.